Hi class, welcome back to Electromagnetics. So this, uh, this lecture we're going to continue our look at uh, propagating waves in the higher frequencies and how this leads us to um, our distributed circuit model. So let's take a look at that. Thought for the day comes from Acts 17, 24 through 28. Uh, there it says, The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and of earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. Though he is not far from any one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. I don't know, this was just a comforting scripture to me in light of especially things currently going on in our world. That <clears throat> you know, God is in control. This is all according to his plan. And then in him we live and move and have our being. And we'll see that at the distributed circuit model same thing the electromagnetic wave that propagates is all done in this structure that we're going to look at today so you know take comfort in that scripture again we're in part six uh, lecture number five again we're going to look at the distributed circuit concept uh, and the parallel plate transmission line so in previous lecture we considered fields that do not vary with time uh, in the application of Maxwell's equations to these situations and then we extended this to low frequency time varying fields which was the quasi static uh, circuits and we looked at how that worked so again we want to continue to extend our analysis to the cases where the frequency is too high to use this quasi static field approximation that we used earlier so again this is a bit of a challenge as we'll see because we've got to consider the effects the frequency has on the material characteristics as we've already mentioned, as we increase this frequency, uh, the quasi-static approach does not hold. So again, this means we've got to resolve Maxwell's equations. So the major question now is, uh, can we develop a circuit equivalent structure that is independent of the termination of the source and that correctly represents the phenomenon taking place along the structure that is valid for any arbitrary frequency? Even more, can we extend this such that the method is independent of the material parameters themselves? If we can do this, then uh, this could be very useful. Well, as you probably guessed, of course, we could do this. The answer is yes. So we're going to look at how we do that uh, in the remainder of this lecture. So by applying a, a new approach for the concept called the distributed circuit method, we can accomplish all this, uh, which will develop again here in just a second with the parallel plate structure as before. So this was referred to as a parallel plate transmission model. And we can, be, as we'll see later in the course, we're able to extend the analysis from this model to other types of uh, transmission models. So the condition of this model is that the wave uh, is propagating along the structure and that it's a transverse electromagnetic wave, or we refer to that as a TEM wave. You'll see that uh, noted many times in different uh, uh, sources and documents. And so this means that the direction of the electric field and the magnetic fields are entirely transverse to the direction of the propagation of the waves. So to begin this discussion, let's look at Maxwell's equations again. So we're primarily concerned right now with uh, Faraday's law and Ampere's law. And so if we set up our conditions correctly, we can greatly simplify things by making this, for the most part, a one-dimensional uh, situation. So when we do that, that simplifies uh, the vector form of these equations to the scalar form here, which is much easier to work with. So here's the setup for our model. We have our parallel plates uh, running along here, and then we have our transverse plane. So when we say transverse, that's what we mean. And so our way will be propagating uh, down these down this uh, pathway. So you'll see that the E fields will be in the X direction and the H fields will be our magnetic fields will be in the Y direction and the Z component you can see here is in and out of the board. So that's the that's what the direction of the current flow or the current density flow 
on the plates. So you can see uh, this is where we get the term transverse. So this uh, uh, picture right here is actually looking you know, in down the edge of this or you know, one end or the other of these plates. So for this situation, the EM wave, like we said, is transverse as illustrated, illustrated here. So with this condition, we can now uniquely define a voltage between the plates in terms of the electric field in that plane. And we can likewise do so with the current crossing that plane in terms of the magnetic field as follows. So using some tools that we've put in our tool bag um, in the couple, you know, last couple of lectures, we know that we can relate the voltage uh, to the electric field. Um, and in this, this case, it's only an X component. So when we take that integral, we see that the voltage is just the, the depth D times the electric field. Likewise, the current we can relate to the magnetic field by uh, integrating along the, the y direction, so that'd be the width, and we might, we integrate that current density. And when we do uh, work out the integral out, we see that it's just the width times the magnetic field. So this is a very important relationship, both ends of these equations. The voltage is equal to the uh, d component, or the d length, times electric field. The current is going to be equal to the width times the magnetic field. So we need to Remember that as we move forward in the lecture. We now take these definitions and use them to calculate the pointing vector over our transverse plane wave. Uh, and of course, remember to do that, we just take the integral across the entire plane of the electric field crossed with the magnetic field or that cross product. So in this case, we're just integrating from zero to D and zero to W or the depth and the width and we have our electric and magnetic fields, and that'll be in the, both of those are in the, the Z direction. Well, we can take from the previous slide, remember that the electric field is going to be equal, related to the voltage by this uh, depth, and so if we divide both sides of that equation on the last page, we'll see that the E field is equal to the voltage divided by the depth. Likewise, the magnetic field is equal to the current divided by the width. So when we integrate all that out, lo and behold, we come up with that the power in our transverse wave is equal to the voltage times the current. Hopefully this is a very familiar relationship to you as this is what we're taught in circuit analysis that uh, we can calculate the power dissipated in a circuit by multiplying the voltage times the current. So here again we've used Maxwell's equations to kind of work from a different direction to come up with the same result and this is really uh, more in detail of what's going on under the hood of why this relationship is what it is. So we're turning now to our examination of Maxwell's equations. We know that we can represent the electric and magnetic fields uh, as follows. So we, we derived that a couple of slides back relating to the electric field of the voltage and the magnetic field of the current. So we should be able to take these now and substitute these back into our original equation. So if we take uh, Faraday's law, um, we can substitute these back in, and likewise we can take Ampere's law, so where we had an E and an H, our electric and magnetic field here, and then we had a magnetic field, electric field, and the time derivative electric field here. We can put these values directly in. So this is a this is the start down the path of this distributed circuit model. So from here, we can rearrange things just a little bit. And if we do that, move some things around. Here we have uh, Faraday's law and Ampere's law. And so you can see we have everything now in terms of our separated out. We have our voltage and our current separated out here. Same thing here. So we've put everything that's not voltage and current but related to it in these parentheses. So taking a little closer look at this, the quantities in the parentheses we should be able to recognize as our de definitions of the circuit parameters, uh, inductance, conductance, and capacitance that we defined earlier, uh, one or two lectures ago. But uh, in this case, it's the different in that, that they're divided by the length in the z direction, or they're what we like to term as a per unit length. So that being the case, we're going to introduce some new uh, 
terminology here. And so in this mu d over uh, w, we're going to call that the per unit inductance. And this is the per unit conductance and the per unit capacitance. So these new equations are known as the transmission line equations. Uh, and they characterize the wave propagation along the line in terms of circuit quantities instead of field quantities. So this is a very useful uh, because these are things that uh, you know are easier to quantify and keep up with. And this is what you're going to see on cut sheets and spec sheets of different things. So these are the transmission line uh, equations. Uh, again, these are really just Maxwell's equations, Faraday's law, and Ampere's law. But in this case, we're, because of the the, the way we've constructed our, our problem or the, our model, um, we've related voltage and current in here instead of electric field and magnetic field. So again, these are our new per unit length circuit components. And remember, they are uh, inductance per unit length, capacitance per unit length, and conductance per unit length. So uh, very useful. Uh, tools here now in our tool bag. So before we move on, we do want to note some, some pretty interesting observations with these. If we take the inductance per unit length and multiply it times the capacitance per unit length, that simply gives us our permittivity times our permittivity. So just like we've related voltage uh, and current to with our electric field and magnetic field, now we're also uh, relating these per unit uh, quantities to the physical properties of our material, which is which is pretty handy. Likewise, if we take our conductance and divide it by our capacitance, this is going to be our conductivity over our permittivity. And so this would be, you know, what governs things in, <clears throat> in a dielectric for the most part. So in order to utilize these new equations, we must now represent our transmission line by its circuit equivalent. So to do this, we want to do what we've done through this whole course to start looking at you know, infinitesimal lengths uh, in the direction that, of interest, which in this case is z. So when we do that, we're going to take the limit as z uh, goes to zero. <clears throat> and rearranging this, uh, you see that we come up with that uh, looking at this equivalent model, we'll have this voltage at this terminal minus the voltage here has got to equal to uh, the inductance per unit length times the length that we're traveling with delta z times our current, time derivative of our current. Uh, so this equation is represented by this equivalent circuit on the left. Uh, so that was on Faraday's law. We can do the same thing for Ampere's law. Again, taking the limit as z uh, goes to zero for this differential length. Uh, and when we do, we can rearrange things again and we see that we'll have the current across our differential length has got to equal to the conductivity or the conductance, excuse me, times the voltage across that differential length minus the capacitance uh, times the time derivative of that uh, voltage. So again, this can be represented by this equivalent circuit here um, for Faraday's law, I mean, excuse me, Ampere's law. So now we've got Faraday's law and Ampere's law uh, both solved for for these differential lengths. So now the beauty is we can now combine these two uh, equations and or equivalent circuits. So if we take the one from uh, Faraday's law and the one from Ampere's law and just put them together, you can see now we have this new differential unit, we'll say from Z to delta Z and it uh, takes into account uh, the characteristics of that line, transmission line. So now in order to build a transmission path, we take these cells, for lack of a better word, and we simply just connect them together to form a distributed circuit that represents our transmission line. So this is what you know we're dealing with when we're trying to transmit an electromagnetic wave uh, down a long transmission line. We start to see how um, these factors start to affect our wave. So with this uh, new model, we can we also need to stop and think about the stored energy in the electric and magnetic fields. 
of these differential sections. So, you know, in this model, in the electric field, you know, here's our original equation that we had for that times the volume. Well, our new volume is now our dW times our delta Z. Uh, so that gives us our stored energy in that cell. And so we can uh, take that and um, you know, substitute these things, you know, the quantities from those cells back in. And when we do, we see that it's going to be one half times the unit length capacitance times that differential length times the voltage squared. Likewise, we can do the same thing with the magnetic field. Again, you know, modifying it for just our cell, our little unit cell, differential cell. And when we plug all the values in, we see this is going to be one half times uh, the inductance per unit length times the uh, differential length times the current squared. So we can also define the stored energy in the E and H fields uh, for these differential sections uh, in the new new model, um, or the power dissipated, excuse me. So we're looking at the power dissipated uh, across those. And so when we do that, that brings in this conductivity. And so when we start to you know, plug everything in and, and uh, that's uh, specific to our cell models, we come up with the conductivity times per unit length times our differential length times the voltage squared.